Hey there folks, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I don't remember. So this is an episode of Historic Proportions, and man, it doesn't feel like it. Yeah, we all know we got the big album bomb from Taylor Swift with Folklore, where for the first time in Hot 100 history, really chart history, the album and her lead-off single both debuted at number one at the same week. So why does it feel like just another album bomb week? Maybe it's me having already reviewed the album at length last week, or the fact that as an album bomb in 2020, it is one of the better ones. But I also tend to know how long these things will last, even with historic initial impact. And for a project that sounds so unfamiliar to the Hot 100 in general... Well, we'll get into it. But now on to our historic event in our top 10, where I'll admit I'm still kind of shocked she pulled it off. Cardigan by Taylor Swift debuts at number one. Now, I'll get more into my thoughts about the song itself later on, but it is kind of surprising she managed to smash through in all channels, especially on sales and streaming, even as it's making its radio run now. Hell, even though I did say that Rockstar by DaBaby and Roddy Rich was weakening last week, especially in on-demand streaming, Streaming, it is kind of a testament to Taylor Swift's strength that she could blow right past Rockstar's still increasing radio to push it back to number two. And if that's the case, the remix of What's Poppin' from Jack Harlow and crew didn't have a prayer pushed back to number three. It might have the streaming and it's got the YouTube, but I would not call its radio run all that stellar right now. Then we have our second Taylor Swift song with The One, ironically at number four. Similar case as Cardigan, just minus the radio given that Cardigan is the only single that's being actively pushed there right now. Now, that's an understandable mistake from her camp, but I do think it's a mistake nonetheless. And the reason why, once we move past Blinding Lights by the weekend at number 5, which has finally slipped into Radio Freefall to begin its exit from the top 10, well, it ties into the next Taylor Swift song here, her collaboration with Bon Iver, Exile, at number 6. To put it bluntly, if pushed properly, this might actually be a hit, and not the only one from the album. If I don't see this or The Last Great American Dynasty shipped to radio within a month or so, somebody will have screwed up royally at Republic. Hell, I'd even take August, even if it is kind of on the nose given the timing right now. Now, keep in mind these are album bomb entries, and that likely means most will fall out of the top 10 next week, so it's worth looking at our last four top 10 entries, which will likely gain. Starting with Watermelon Sugar by Harry Styles at number 7, which will likely hold thanks to strong radio and and sales, followed by Rose's I'm a Beck remix by St. John at number 8 for many of the same reasons, although the softening streaming and even radio is starting to tell me. Now finally, we're ending with two Savage songs, the first from Megan Thee Stallion and Beyonce at number 9 on its respectable way out, most likely getting replaced by Savage Love by Josh685 and Jason Derulo breaking the top 10 at number 10. Again. It's rising in all channels, folks. I sincerely hope you're not sick of it, yet it's gonna stick around. Now from there, we've got the expected massive list of losers and dropouts. And if the past couple album bombs did damage, this was the finishing blow for a lot of songs. From those that clinched their year-end list spot, like Sunday Best by Surfaces, Does To Me by Luke Combs featuring Eric Church, and likely The Scots by Travis Scott and Kid Cudi, to those that are just gonna fall short, like After Party by Don. Tolliver, Chicago Freestyle by Drake, and Flex by Polo G and Juice World. Now our losers... Oh god. Look folks, there's over 40 of them. The only way I'm gonna get through any of this is in segments. So let's start with the expected losses off the debut for those Drake and DJ Khaled songs from last week, with Popstar going down to 14 and Grease falling hard to 55. Then we have all those gains short-circuited from last week, with Rain On Me by Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande cut off at 29, Bluebird by Miranda Lambert down at 43, Chasing You by Morgan Wallen at 49, Emotionally Scarred by Lil Baby at 54, Four, Said Some by Moneybag Yo at 60, Girls in the Hood by Megan Thee Stallion at 61, Rags to Riches by Rod Wave Cut Short at 64, Got What I Got by Jason Aldean at 65, Done by Chris Jansen at 68, I Love My Country by Florida George Line at 69, not a good week for country here, Walk em Down by Annalie Choppa at 70, Like That by Doja Cat featuring Gucci Mane at 76, Be a Light by Thomas Rhett and Co. at 80, and Don't Rush by Young T, Bugs 
featuring Heady One at 86. Then we got our continued losers from Juice World with Hate the Other Side with Marshmallow Kid Leroy and Polo G at 72, Conversations at 74, Life's a Mess with Halsey at 82, Righteous at 87, and Blood on My Jeans at 90. And as for the rest, okay, We Paid by Lil Baby and 42 Doug falling to 34, The Box by Roddy Rich at 45, Falling by Trevor Daniel at 48, The Bigger Picture by Lil Baby at 50, really hope that rebounds, Super Lonely by Benet and Gus Dapperton at 62, If the World Was Ending by J.P. Sachs and Julia Michaels at 66, Tusi Slide by Drake at 75, Got It On Me and It's Something Special by Pop Smoke at 77 and 93, Why We Drink by Justin Moore at 81, One of Them Girls by Lee Bryce at 83, Cool Again by Kane Brown at 84, and Mama Sita by the Black Eyed Peas featuring Ozuna and J. Soul at 85. Finally, to end things off, Stuck With You by Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber at 88. Huh, this fell hard and fast. God Whispered Your Name by Keith Urban at 89. More Than My Hometown by Morgan Wallen at 92. Need It by Migos featuring Young Boy Never Broke Again at 94. Be Kind by Halsey and Marshmallow at 96. I Love You by Surf Mesa featuring Emily at 98. And Girl of My Dreams by Rod Wave at 100. Now, okay, you would think a week like this would not have that much in the way of gains or returns, but we actually did get a scattered few here. For one, that Kid Leroy project that I don't think anybody cared about did manage to get its Juice World collab go back at 91, and in our gains... Off the debut last week, The Climb Back by J. Cole surged up to 52. Along with Mood Swings by Pop Smoke featuring Lil TJ to 59. Not sure why this one and not Got It On Me got the boost, but okay. But what's more notable is riding off the video, we got Dollars On My Head by Gunna featuring Young Thug up to 78. My mistake last week, I accidentally mistook this song for something else. It actually came back last week at 98 then, and it's on its way up now. But as I've mentioned, we got the bigger story we are in an album bomb situation. And thus, here are the Taylor Swift songs that fell out, not in the top 40, but were neither the best nor worst of the week. Hoax at 71, Peace at 58, Epiphany at 57, Mad Woman at 47, Illicit Affairs at 44, although man, that one was close, and Betty at 42. And that last one's probably going to stick around, just watch. Now the rest, well, they're in our considerable list of new arrivals. Which unfortunately has to start with number 95, Perfect by Logic. I started from the bottom, now my neighborhood is gated. They say drink to your accomplishments, so every night I'm faded. Feel like every other day me and somebody new related. How is it that the only song from that new Logic album to hit the Hot 100 is the worst of them? And it's bad in the same way that a lot of Logic's crossover work is. A bare bones trap beat with awkward synths, Logic trying to show off more personality on the single version and not much of it translating, and it basically resulting in a lot of empty bragging that doesn't help Logic stand out. Of course, the line that does stand out for me is Logic flipping the Juicy J line and how he likes shooting shots like the police, because who's gonna stop the police from leaving bodies in the street? Okay, first off, if that's a flip to make some sort of measured point or societal commentary, it is tenuous at best. But more importantly, you're still comparing yourself to the cops in a pop positive way, because this song can't even pretend to be subversive, and in this climate? Really? So, uh, no, this fragment of a song is not good. Next. Number 63, Un Dia, One Day by J Balvin, Dua Lipa, Bad Bunny, and I'll admit when I saw this lineup on the collaboration, I was kind of surprised. What was Dua Lipa doing hopping on a J Balvin Bad Bunny collab of all things? And the funny thing is that it doesn't even have the standard reggaeton percussion or groove that you would expect with this. The percussion's kind of rougher, playing off the waves of Misty Synth for a little more of a sandy vibe. And Dua Lipa singing in English does a fine enough job anchoring the hook. I guess it kind of makes sense why she is here. She did hop on that Brock Hampton remix after all. Maybe she's got better taste. And the writing is all right too, with Dua Lipa playing the girl knowing full well that her wayward ex is going to want her back. And while she's kind of annoyed by the situation, she is comfortable waiting it out. With Jay Balvin and Bad Bunny playing the guys bucking against their own pride to try to make something work in the apology. And 
all of this kind of works, but I do think this song could have used a slight switch up before the final hook, because otherwise it just kind of wallows in one mood without much in the way of resolution or change. Still, in comparison with most reggaeton, it feels a bit more distinct, and you know what, I don't think this is bad at all. Cool stuff, if you're curious, check it out. Next up, number 56, Happy Anywhere by Blake Shelton featuring Gwen Stefani. Since I met you, I swear I could be happy anywhere. Okay, honest question, who is really invested in the Blake Shelton-Gwen Stefani musical collaborations? I'm not talking about the celebrity relationship, which may or may not have fans, I have no idea. I'm talking about these milk toast, badly produced duets that leave me wondering who in the hell this is trying to serve. This debuted this high thanks mostly to sales, so clearly there is some sort of market that wants to hear Blake Shelton making an otherwise fine-sounding neo-traditional country tune with a lot of warm, raw banjo and pedal steel and Gwen Stefani on glorified backing vocals. I mean, my problem is that not only do they have very little chemistry, there is nothing here that's lyrically that gives this song any sort of flair or potency. It just sounds really complacent, even by country standards. And both these artists are capable of way more than this. I mean, it might be better produced than the last collaboration, but it is no less forgettable. I ain't going back to this. Next. Number 51, Lion King on Ice by J. Cole. I ain't gonna lie, I got real, real big plans. I ain't gonna lie, I got a whole lot to prove. I mean, second time's the charm. Look, I will admit I was harsh on that last J. Cole song, mostly because I couldn't stand the production and J. Cole's lyrical content these days continues to get under my skin in a way I'm shocked a lot of his fans don't seem to hear. But hey, maybe this would be better given that T- is handling more of the production? Well, no, that didn't happen because somehow he actually got another elongated chipmunk sample that just sounds horrible off that blubbery trap beat. It doesn't synchronize or syncopate well with his flow or the percussion. It actively distracts from what actually could be a cool groove here. And that's kind of frustrating because the rest of the song is fine. The hook is decent. J. Cole's a little bit less sour as he reflects upon some of his insecurities still unfulfilled and how his hopes to help out the kids who became a flash in the pan in the rap game didn't quite work out. I'm looking at Lil Pump right there. So now he's trying to be a little bit more open as he's looking to be stronger to reach new heights for himself. And while I won't say there's a lot of detail that really jumps out as all that unique, J. Cole these days has a really bad habit of putting in a lot of filler bars and I I gotta admit that kind of puts me off, but if it wasn't for that ugly ass sample for the melody, this would be fine, it'd be perfectly serviceable. But as it is, it's okay to say it, still can't recommend it. Next up, number 46, Nobody's Love by Maroon 5. We had a chance to get rid of them. We could all just let memories be their final moment to let us all walk away, but nope, they're pushing another new song. The second single for that next upcoming album, and at least the production's kind of okay. I don't mind going for the late 80s soft rock guitar rollick. It's less embarrassing than when Maroon 5 tried the trap pop thing, but it doesn't have the best color or punch with the great material with this sound. And that's even before we get to the content, where we get one of the more clingy love songs I've heard in a while, which rarely sounds good coming out of Adam Levine. It's a tried and true formula and it's never worked for him. If you ever left, I'd go psychotic, fit me like a glove and I can't knock it. All with these professions that he's not lying, which is one of those things you shouldn't have to bring up in a love song like this is trying to be sincere, but none of it matches the tone that is so languid and low key, which really reflects lazy composition as a whole. As it is, like with Maroon 5's material for the past decade, it's lazy radio filler, not even a good example of it. In other words, I don't like it. Next, number 39, This Is Me Trying by Taylor Swift. So I've already made a long review of Folklore where I've at least referenced or mentioned many of these songs. And thus, like most album bombs, I'm going to try to keep this what, somewhat brief. 
with the exception of this song because my god i did not know i needed taylor swift to combine a lot of the arcs of back to december and the archer until she did folks this might be one of her most emotionally devastating songs in her entire catalog and i do not use those words lightly uh, yeah to some extent from the outside looking in it might seem insane to use them about taylor swift until you read the details. This is the moment where Taylor Swift rips away the veneers, and despite some of the filmy, reverb-heavy production, it only further intensifies the loneliness of it that has been echoing in her content for a long time now. The fading glamour that she wants to preserve but can't, the regrets that she can't quite purge, how despite seeming to have everything put together, she's falling towards stasis, unable to move on, and then comes all the references to alcohol abuse that folks have been noticing since Reputation. And like with Back to December, the sad truth of this song is that as hard as she's trying for any sort of release, be it forgiveness or reconciliation or just to move on properly, it's not coming. The denial of that closure is the heartbreak. For as hard as she's trying, it's not working. And to hear that echo nearly 10 years after she tried last time, it's all the more potent. Taylor Swift has claimed that many of these songs are rooted in fiction, maybe not quite as personal, but there are exceptions scattered across the album, and this is one of them. All the more powerful for it. So yeah, this could be among one of the best songs of 2020, full stop. The Archer might have faded on me for a little bit, but I do not think this will. At least I hope not because this is exceptional. Number 37, Invisible String by Taylor Swift. All along there was some invisible string. Now this, on the other hand, this was a moment on Folklore that just kind of felt flat for me. One of two on the album back to back here. And what frustrates me is that it's one of the oddest pivots in Taylor Swift's catalog. The plucked strings, the sandy beats, the abstract trace of colors and thread calling back to Japanese myth and all the threads of fate that would tie us together. It's a fascinating experiment for her, but it also feels a little bit flat in some of the stylism and the focus on symbols. Not quite infused with the same distinctive emotive core that gives her her best material. Coupled with a rather underwhelming groove as well. It's pretty, I get why people like it, but not a song that I'll personally revisit much. Just saying. Number 35, Seven by Taylor Swift. I won't tell no other, and though I can't recall your face, I still got love for you. And on that topic, Taylor Swift's vocals at her softest around the delicate touches of strings and acoustics sliding around the piano. A hook where she goes for a slightly choppier cadence that doesn't quite land its nostalgic storytelling. More focusing on a childlike friendship where they dream of living in faraway lands. Really dialing into the folklore side of this album. It's one of the cuts that's generally pleasant, but it also feels like a rather disconnected interlude on the album as a whole, and probably the most fictional in its abstraction. Now, it's also a song where some Taylor Swift fans are saying it implies a queer relationship, and that Taylor Swift could be telling us something here. I mean, I see a trace of it in the closet line, but that feels like a bit of a stretch. More of a blurry dream of the song than something that's more tactile and real. Otherwise, it's okay, but again, not a song I go back to much. Number 26, Mirror Ball by Taylor Swift. Spinning in my highest heels, love, shining just for you. Was I the only one who got a bit of Golden Hour era Casey Musgraves vibes to some of the textures and the supple sleigh bells and the reverb guitars here? Maybe a bit chillier, but that makes sense. If it's the glassy glitter of the song where Taylor Swift sees herself as a reflective presence in this dreamy relationship, where there is a plea that she can be everything for this person or maybe her audience. Indeed, if there is a song that's more metaphorical here in encapsulating its joy in relationship, it might be this, where she's recognizing as a performer everything that she does to try and appear genuine, find that symbiotic connection, and how much harder it can be when she really cares and with the real shattered cracks in her personality that are still there. Time and experience will do that. Honestly, I think the only reason I don't think this is among her absolute best is that the song kind of ends abruptly. It could have really soared for a great climax, but as it is, I still think this is very good. Check it out. I wouldn't mind if this stuck around. Number 23, August by Taylor Swift. Hell yeah. 
hell, this one might actually be even better. Now, of the five songs I dearly love on Folklore, this might be the weakest, but it's still absolutely excellent. Cushion of warm, gentle acoustics and a soft pattern, the percussion around rumblings of waves in the low end, hints of sax and flute, Taylor Swift leaning into her Lana Del Rey-esque cooing, but also anchored, but then slipping towards something more exuberant and charged on the bridge, where the glam of that doomed summer romance will slip away for one saving throw to make it work, but he was never hers to lose. And it's one of those fictional cuts along with Betty and Cardigan that stand alone in her teenage love story triplet, and some of the details, like canceling plans to meet behind a mall, they're just note-perfect youthful romance and capturing that scene, and songs like this are a great intersection point between Taylor Swift's older, more adolescent material and the songwriter she's maturing to be, or really always was. And now I would not mind this being a single. Great song? Check it out. Hope it sticks around. Number 16, My Tears Ricochet by Taylor Swift. I'll admit I'm a little bit torn on this song. On the one hand, it's very obviously metaphorical, and speaking with Taylor Swift's broken relationship with Scott Braschetta over at Big Machine, where she gave them diamonds and riches despite the abuse that she was handed, and when she finally got away, they hurled venom, with her pain now landing on them even as they show up to her funeral to pay respects, even despite stealing her lullabies. Hell, with so much focus on the funeral as a central metaphor, with all the production leaning on fate keys and horns, you would think that she might go for something a little bit more gothic in the presentation. She probably could pull it off. But as a whole, the song feels a little bit more tasteful and refined in its delivery, and that does kind of kill any sense of deeper edge. Plus, I will say this, the central scene can feel a bit confused in the metaphor. I mean, how is she still producing tears if she's dead? I'm just trying to put the scene together. I don't know, it's still fine, but she has made better songs. Like number 13, The Last Great American Dynasty by Taylor Swift. She had a marvelous time ruining everything. If there's an obvious single where Taylor Swift could have a lot of fun with a theatrical music video, it's this. And it also happens to be one of the best songs on the album, without question. Probably the closest that Taylor Swift has gotten in her musings on broader American iconography to actually sticking the landing, mostly by grounding the story in that of real-world figure Rebecca Harkness, who married one of the last heirs of Standard Oil, who then died and left Harkness a lot of obscene wealth before she died. And what I love about the song is how Taylor Swift uses her language. The story seems like rich, dismissive, small-town wasp gossip subtly getting twisted by Harkness who's now running wild in the aftermath of her husband's death. Only in decades after her death and the holiday house left empty does Taylor Swift herself show up and buy it, showing a pretty obvious kinship with the woman, especially in how she was stigmatized for really very little. The line, I had a marvelous time ruining everything, it's just the best, and deliver with this the perfect balance of wry weariness. And I could go on about how Taylor Swift is a great writer and showing subtle class divisions and how they're still pretty entrenched in American society, or how the production just has this low, understated patter off the drum machine, off the piano, that's so playful in its execution, or how Taylor Swift underplays the song impeccably with quietly one of the best hooks of her career, uh, but yeah. This is something special. And while we're in this territory, number six, Exile by Taylor Swift featuring Bon Iver. I think I've seen this film before. I can argue that Justin Vernon taking the vocal lead here that Matt Berninger otherwise didn't for whatever reason, but I'm starting there because why doesn't he use this range more often with Bon Iver? I mean, my god, this sounds like the Bon Iver of 10 years ago that I really liked. Not all the contorted electronic warping that's made so many of his recent albums so frustrating. And Justin Vernon has more chemistry with Taylor Swift than I think she's had with anybody. 
ever. And I think a real part of it is that there's some real tension between them. They play X's where Taylor Swift is dancing now with her current partner. He spots them from across the room. And in a second, it all flies apart with a rush of memory and heartache and everything that did not used to work but left down enough roots that will never quite be fulfilled. Enough things left unsaid but still hang in the atmosphere. Oh, and we also get the best crescendo on the album, riding off the supple pianos and strings to open into a gentle swell with that subtle click in the percussion. Even beyond some of the breathy vocal interplay, it's not the first time there's a trace of Imogen Heap on this album, which I really loved. Again, I could not be happier. Again, one of the three best songs on this album, and if by some miracle this sticks around, even if not in the top 10, we'll all be better for it. And if they make it a single, it'll be even better. Number four, The One by Taylor Swift. For never leaving well enough alone But it would have been fun If you would have been the one Keep this short, I'll repeat what I said in the review with the song. I don't know why Taylor Swift started this low key with the album. The clicking drum machine feels really flat opposite the pianos and acoustics, and if it wasn't for her good vocal delivery, some nice touches of strings, and a decent tasteful reflection on a past relationship that could have worked but didn't, this might have felt like a bit of a dud. As it is, it's good, but it feels a little bit redundant on the project, and it's a bit of a slow start that only hints at the album's greater potential and sound. It's it's not bad by any means, not great either, but while we're in that territory, number one, Cardigan by Taylor Swift. Under someone's bed, you put me on and said I was your favorite. And I'm a little bit mystified as to why Taylor Swift chose this as her leadoff single. Again, it's not a song I think is bad. Like August, it's reportedly tied into this teenage love story triplet, this time from the girlfriend's perspective as she has to leave the cheating dude behind. And there's a lot of good detail here. The adult assumption that you don't fully grasp what's happening when in reality you do. The big step of maturity to value yourself and leave him behind because he's clearly not mature enough to get it. But also enough smoky allure and wistful glamour to realize where there might have been attraction in the first place, and that's harder to contextualize and deal with. That being said, while I get the cardigan metaphor why it was used, in terms of lyrical cadence, it still feels a little bit clunky, and I'm not sure I'm completely sold on the production either. The glassy patter playing off the muted keys, the fractured glassy touches emphasizing the damp mistiness of the song, and maybe at a tempo that's a shade bit too fast and doesn't really modulate as much as it should, it does pick up by the end, but but not much? Again, I'm not sure how this song will truly sell how good the album is. It's got a decent vibe with solid writing, but again, there's much better songs on the album in terms of singles, and just another entry in Taylor Swift having some baffling choices for the lead. But hey, that was our week. Again, it was a good album bomb, so even if it felt long, I'm generally fine with a lot of this. To the point where I'm giving the best of the week to This Is Me Trying by Taylor Swift, because my god, that song's incredible, and a tie for honorable mention between Exile and The Last Great American Dynasty. Really, all three of these songs have a credible shot for my year-end list, and I'm bound to switch up their order at least once, just warning you now. Now, the worst of the week... Yeah, Nobody's Love by Maroon 5 is getting that. If only because the lyrics do not match the melodic tone at all, and it's just jarring in how it comes together. And just edging out J. Cole, we've got Perfect by Logic snagging the dishonorable mention, almost entirely on that final reference in some of the synth work. Charming. Next week, though, whew, the fallout from all this. We might actually stick around given a slow release week, so stay tuned for that. But until then... I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.